<laughs> welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Really grateful for your time. And I uh, also want to welcome everyone who's joining us tonight on Zoom and or joining us through uh, virtually. So really grateful for your time here. Um, and I'm really confident this is going to be a wonderful night. So thank you so much. So I would like to, uh, before we move forward, take a moment um, uh, just to acknowledge that we're gathered here this evening on the ancestral homeland of the um, and traditional ancestral lands of the Miami, Potawatomi, Shawnee, Lenape, and other native peoples of the past and present. We also acknowledge that IUPUI displaced the African-American business and residential neighborhoods of Indiana Avenue and Ransom Place in the late 1960s. We honor all those who have cared for this place in the past, and we hope sincerely that its current use for the pursuit and sharing of knowledge and understanding, which are goals of the university, will lead to a future that is more equitable and just. Before I introduce tonight's Jane Fortune, outstanding women artist, women artist lecturer, Peter Coyne, I would like to recognize and share a few other notes and reminders. Parking tonight is made possible by the great frame up of Indianapolis and Carmel. We thank them for their continued dedication and support. Uh, for parking validation information, please see our gallery attendants in the main gallery. This is the gallery right to our left as you walk out of here. Um, I'd also like to invite you to join us for two other upcoming talks. Tomorrow, November 9th, we're welcoming the Idle George Contemporary Art Fellow, Ruth Cuthand. Um, the 2023 Idle George Contemporary Art Fellowship is titled Unsettle, Converge, highlighting those who are leading the way in dismantling settler colonial definitions of contemporary native art to actively present native voices and visions. Ruth Cathan will give a talk on her recent work here in the Basile Auditorium tomorrow from 3 to 4.30 p.m. It'll be followed by a reception for the artist after the talk. So please join us if you can. It'll be right here. And again, that's from 3 to 4.30. On November 15th, Gonkar Gayatso, an internationally celebrated Tibetan British artist, will speak about his global practice. That talk will be hosted here in Vasil Auditorium, November 15th at 6 p.m. Lastly, before I introduce tonight's guest of honor, I want to remind you all that this evening, we also open a very special exhibition organized by Gregory Glasson and Jacob Dobson on behalf of the National Sculpture Society. We're grateful for their incredible work in putting this exhibition together to share with the greater Indianapolis community. Greg Glasson in particular has worked tirelessly making numerous out of state trips to personally bring the artwork of many artists to Heron. I also wanna thank Heron's gallery director and curator, Paula Katz and our gallery manager, Elias Garza Garcia for all of their hard work and for all the time. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, okay. Yes, yes. The figurative sculptural invitational exhibition on view in the Marsh Gallery, which is all the way down at the end of this hall, be on your left towards the end of the hall, um, will run through January 20th, 2024. Um, and the show ex highlights 15 sculptors who have drawn their inspiration from the human figure and animal forms. Many of these artists have traveled here to be with us tonight. So. If you have a chance, please see if you can meet them. And we really are grateful for everyone being here. Um, the reception for the show and for this celebration of the Jane Fortune Lecture runs through 8 p.m. this evening. So the Jane Fortune Outstanding Women Visiting Artist Lecture Series brings internationally acclaimed female artists to Indianapolis. A gift from Indiana philanthropist Jane Fortune, author, art historian, and founder of Advancing Women Artists Foundation, has made the lecture series possible. Tonight, I couldn't be more pleased to welcome Peter Coyne to Heron. As a sidebar, I'm excited to share that Peter's brother, Thomas Coyne, is a Heron alum who graduated in 1973. Peter Coyne is an amazing contemporary sculptor and photographer, best known for her large hanging sculptures and floor installations. Her magical and ambitious tableaus transform galleries into sites of contemplation and investigation. Unafraid to confront a range of subjects or tackle contemporary issues, the themes of Peter's innate dualities are transposed in the dichotomous theme, themes of her work, transformation and constancy, life and loss, beauty and darkness. Throughout her body of work, Peter has drawn inspiration and media from a wide range of sources, from literature and film, world culture and natural environment, to the artist's own personal biography. 
She is notably acclaimed for shedding light on lesser known female writers and Eastern literary figures. Working in innovative and disparate materials, her media has ranged from the organic to the ephemeral, dead fish, mud, sticks, hay, black sand, specially formulated and patented wax, satin ribbons, silk flowers, and shaved cars are a few of the things she has incorporated into her sculptures. More recently, Pita has worked with glass, velvet, taxidermy, cast wax, statuaries, and trees. Her work is in numerous permanent museum collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the Whitney Museum of Art, the Brooklyn Museum, Philadelphia Museum of Art, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the National Gallery of Art, and the Montreal Museum of Fine Art, to name just a few. A short list of recognitions includes awards from the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, Pollock Krasner Foundation, Joan Mitchell Foundation, and three National Endowment for the Arts Awards. She has been re reviewed by many noteworthy publications, including Art in America, Art Forum, Freeze, the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Times of London, the Wall Street Journal, Village Voice, Vogue Magazine, and the Washington Post. I could stand up here all night and tell you more of her extraordinary accomplishments, but instead, I will ask you to please help me uh, welcome Peter Coyne to the stage. Thanks. <laughs> well, I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, Paula drove me by the old Heron um, Art School and I recognized it immediately. Even though I was in high school when my brother uh, went to school here, I remember coming as a high school student and just being enthralled. I so wanted to come to Heron College uh, of Art. And um, he used to tell me all about it in all his classes and I was just thrilled. Um, and, um, and this afternoon when I went to uh, Sam's um, studio, I was so excited. You are so lucky to have um, Samuel Levi Jones here in your midst. And if you ever get the opportunity to sneak, steal, or uh, creep over to his studio, do it. Um, I had the best afternoon just listening to him and looking at his newest work. It is such a treat and one I will not forget for a long time. Um, there are those studio visits that just kind of go throughout your mind. But then there's those you'll you'll never forget. And his is one that I won't forget for a very long time. So you're very lucky to have him. And, and he graduated right here from here. And so I know how many great people graduate. You have such a special school here. And um, I know it's because of all the different teachers that teach and you're led by such a great man. So you're very lucky. Um, I'd like to tell you just a little bit before I start about my own background. I think that's one of the best things I always love when I go to listen to hear people talk is kind of like, where did they come from and why do they make art, you know? And um, um, I was raised um, an army brat. If you can imagine, we moved 15 times before I was even 12 years old. We just moved all the time. I always knew um, when I came home that we were moving again because th there were always these um, uh, on our carpet, there was just kind of like different dark spots on the on the rugs and stuff. And I was like, oh, we're, we're leaving again. And it was so exciting. My parents made it really fun. They made it so exciting. And the thing that was so fun about it was that they wanted us to be really excited about education. Now, they didn't care, and I hate to say this in front of any uh, teachers and things, they didn't really care 
where we went to school, they just wanted us to hunger for knowledge. They wanted us to be really excited about anything. So if there was something going on in the town, something thrilling, they would literally um, go and get us out of school and take us there. Much to the chagrin of all my friends, they were like, I want parents like that. You know, it was like, and we would go, we would take helicopters and fly over volcanoes that were erupting. And my dad would get us in submarines and we'd go to the bottom of the ocean and then we would snorkel and scuba dive. And then those volcanoes that were erupting, we would go back five years later and we would walk over them and see how hot the earth still was, that it would burn our tennis shoes. Like, so there was almost nothing left of them. But the one thing that I remember the most was when I was just five years old, maybe I was six, and my mother went and got all of us out of school. At that time, there were only three of us. And she took us to the beach and there was this huge whale. And I mean, the biggest whale I ever saw. I'm How many had I seen at that point, right? But this thing had beached itself on Waikiki and and I just remember looking at his eye, his eye must have been as big as I was and it would open and it would look and then it would close and, and it was breathing really raggedy and, and it had marks all over its body. I, I do remember all those scars and my mom said, now we're gonna spend the day with this whale and I want you to draw it and I want you to look at it. And I want you to think up a story, like take a scar, any any of the scars that he has and make up a story of how he got that scar. And then we're gonna tell your dad tonight at dinner, your story and make it a good one. And I remember thinking, gosh, what do I know about, you know, his life? What what kind of story could I tell? And I, I told my mother this and she was like, now come on, you snorkel and you see the coral your father brings back from deep in the ocean. You know, you know the fish, you know about his life. And I think, well, yes, I do. I'm sure I do. And I could make up a grand story. And she said, and this is the only time you're allowed to lie. You can make up wonderful lies. And I was like, oh, this will be a great story. And I remember telling my story and being so proud. And my brother and sister told their story. And my dad told us that they were brilliant stories. And my mother said, now, after we have dinner and after we do the dishes, I'm going to read to you a story about another man's run in with another whale. And so that night she started to read us Moby Dick. And I remember thinking, oh my, he's a much better storyteller than I am. And I've got to work on my stories. And that's what my parents always did. They would inspire us to to do things and then they would show us something that was much much better and that would encourage us to go even further to do even better and that was a great great thing for us and let's see if i do it this way yep there we go and and so we would do these things and i would just think gosh anything that would work for other people wouldn't always work for me with these stories. Cause I remember my brother, he sometime would get discouraged with these stories. And I would tell him, well, it just doesn't matter. You know, it's like how we feel inside ourselves. And so we would discuss a lot of things cause we were Irish twins. We were very, very close in age. And, um, uh, when Tom graduated from Heron, he went straight to New York and I went to the Cincinnati Art Academy and I went back to marry my childhood sweetheart in Dayton, Ohio. And I remember Jody Pinto and Alice Acock and um, Donna Dennis, they all came to Dayton and they told us in their lecture things I had never heard about sculpture at all. 
And I remember thinking, whoa, they're all living in New York and they're telling me things about sculpture I've never heard about before. And they all live in New York and I'm not hearing these things in Dayton. I really better move to New York. So I went home that night and told the, the boy that I had just loved my whole life since I was 13, I have to move to New York. And, and he said, but we just got married like four months ago. And, and I've just started graduate school. And I said, I know, I know. But listen, what I'll do is I'll go to New York. I'll find a great apartment. I'll find a great job. You can come when you finish graduate school. And he was like, okay. And he slept on it that night. And then in the morning, he said, listen, you're not leaving me here in Dayton. I'm coming with you. I'll, I'll just... I'll just, I don't like graduate school that much anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to come with you. So I said, great, you know, we'll borrow my parents' station wagon. We'll pack it. We'll go surprise Tom, who was my older brother, and we'll move in with him. And <laughs> so that's what we did. We packed the car. We were gone in three days and we moved to New York and we surprised Tom and he had just finished Columbia University in painting and filmmaking, and he was surprised. And um, so that's, uh, we moved in with Tom and um, I said, just till I can find my own loft and whatever. He had a big loft down in Tribeca with a few of his other friends from Columbia. And they were like seeing us, I had no idea how small the places were in New York. And he was living there with quite a few people. And I brought in, box after box after box you know I that station wagon was packed you know and I moved in and um I got a job right away we took the station wagon back and I remember starting to read like Rauschenberg and Johns and Solowit and Lucy Lepard and all those people and everything I read everything I had been making in Dayton made no sense to me in New York and I was working, I got a job in advertising. I knew nothing about advertising, but I kind of bluffed my way in there. And I just was walking home at night, every night. And I remember Rauschenberg said, whatever you are looking at and whatever you are seeing, that's probably what is your work. And so every night I would walk home and I would end up in Chinatown looking at the dead fish. And so I thought, well, okay, maybe this is kind of my medium. And um, by that time, Lamar, my husband and I had gotten a loft and Tom had moved in with us. And so we were in this loft on Broom Street and I began to paint the walls black and cover the windows with black plastic and hang up all my dead fish. And I would get paid on Friday, right? And I would count up the money for rent and food and then all the other money I would spend on buying these dead fish. I thought the fish were just beautiful. I thought there was nothing I could make as a sculptor that would be more beautiful than these dead fish, right? I mean, they don't need to be eaten. I thought I could give them a better send off, you know, as art. And I didn't do this for a month. I didn't do this for three months. I didn't even do this for a year. I did this for five years. I kid you not. I was serious about my dead fish, right? So, and I must say, I was rather like an alcoholic. I would go every Friday to the Chinese stores and I would say, listen, I have enough dead fish. And I would just look, I would just look until I'd say, well, I worked so hard this week, like one dead fish, one dead fish can't hurt, right? One. And I put it in my basket and then I'd say, it needs a mate, right? So then I'd put another. And before I knew it, I had two baskets of dead fish and I'd be like, well, uh, okay, there we go again. And I know finally the Chinese women would come over to me and they'd say, you know, we notice you in here quite often. What are you making? And I'd say, oh gosh, um, I couldn't tell them I was making art and I didn't want to say I was hanging it from the ceiling. 
on the on the, on the line, you know? So again, I come out and I I hated to do it because I don't like to lie, but I lied. I said I was making soup for the poor. And do you know what they said to me? They said, we'll give you a discount. <laughs> now you do not give an alcoholic a discount. You just don't do those sorts of things. And I said, thank you so much, you know? And so I was back there, you know, right away the next week buying more dead fish. And pretty soon my husband got eye infections, terrible eye infections. And the doctor who we went to said, are you using a new like um, soap or something, you know, maybe in your laundry? And I said, no, it could be all the dead fish fish that we have hanging in our loft and he looks up at me and I, you know my father's a doctor I uh, he wrote KR in the chart and I know that that meant crock full of shit you know and I said I said my father's a doctor I I know what that means and I said I'm an I'm an artist and um and I was very proud of the fact I said that's my art form and he looked at me and he said, well, I'm a doctor and I'm, and you're going to start a plague down in Soho if you don't get those things out of your loft. And I said, oh, okay, thank you very much. And so um, I said to my friends, I guess, you know, Lamar may go blind if I don't do something with these fish. And they said, well, think of something creative. Think of something creative. And I said, well, I did, you know, like what else would you want? And they said, well, beyond this. And I said, okay, let's take them out to Long Island. Let's take them out to a beautiful place and let's give them as a gift to somebody. I said, what better gift could you give to anyone than my dead fish, right? So I found a beautiful place in Long Island called Garden City. It was gorgeous. And all my five friends, we took bags and bags of dead fish. And I said, what we'll do is we'll go in the middle of the night and we'll do their yard like a tsunami had come in, right? So in the morning, it will be this grand gift to them, right? What could be more wonderful? I would love that. I'm sure any of you would love that, right? Wake up in the morning, a tsunami has come in, not your neighbors, just your yard, right? Dead fish everywhere, in the trees, over the cars, all over your bushes. You know, I mean, I can't think of anything more wonderful. Now, my we did it so quietly. Not a dog barked, right? It was on their fish line. It was in their trees. Now, my friends took the five o'clock train back to New York. They had to get to work. I took the day off. I stood across the street. I was proud as they could be. I was so happy. And I thought we they would wake up. We could all have breakfast together, talk about esoteric things. I was so happy. And so... I was waiting for them to wake up. The father woke up about, I think, oh, he must have gotten up at about seven. And then the kids got up, you know, and the father opened the door and he dropped his briefcase. And I could see by his face, he wasn't so happy. He was like, um, uh, I would say, it wasn't, uh, he was, he was mad. He was mad. That was a good word. And then uh, all the I spent so much money on this. The octopus, the squid, you know, the baby barracudas. I mean, it was to me, it was the most beautiful thing you could ever give to anybody. And I'm telling you now, don't ever do this. Don't do this unless you ask somebody and get their permission. I will never do this another time. Never, ever, ever. I did this in the eighties. I won't ever do it again without permission. I walked away so quietly, like I didn't know who did it. I never saw this fish.
And I went back to the city and I hid in my loft, like he would know it was me. You know, I have never been back to Garden City ever again. Never, never. Uh uh. And I was so, so embarrassed. And my friends said to me, listen, you could do this in New York. Nobody will care if you do it in New York. Nobody. They, you know, New York was broke at the time. You could do blocks of it in New York. And so that's what we did. We started to do blocks of dead fish in these trees. And they were so beautiful. And we did blocks and we would hang them up at night. And then like sometimes this was about Christmas time. We put bells on them. And, you know, sometimes they were, some of them were covered with, polymer and Rolplex and they would hit and they sounded like bamboo and they were so so nice and um I must say um uh it made the New Yorker it made New York Magazine and they all said whoever's doing these delightful installations bravo and I thought oh, I found my audience New York <laughs> City you know and it would take a week for the um, garbage men to take them down, but it was up for a good week. And I was so proud, you know, New Yorkers, they get it. And the ones who didn't, they just walked by. So this was grand, you know? And so then I thought, okay, I could do public art and people would appreciate it. This was good. Okay. So then I started doing like art on the beach and, I did a piece in Chicago and then I can't show you all them. I've done so many, but then I did a, another favorite. One of mine was one in Houston, Texas, and this was sister Elizabeth Throckmorton. Now I built sister Elizabeth Throckmorton. She is a beautiful nun and I built her on a six lane highway coming out of Houston. And it was totally great because I built her on a curve of a road, right? So as you're coming out of Houston and you're coming out at, at dusk, you got your headlights on and you're on this curve of the road and all of a sudden your headlights hit her and she's 24 feet wide and 15 feet tall. It looks like you're going to mow her down, right? But right before you do, you go the curve in the road, right? And on the other side, coming into Houston, there was a mummy, mummified one. And you would see this mummy, the same thing. And it was a park, like a place where you could um, jog and you could jog up to her or up from the behind of her. And you could open her in the back, right? And it what it did was, if you open those big doors, in the front, it gave her black wings, which kind of questioned, did, she, did the nuns that we loved so much go to heaven or maybe not, you know, maybe the other way, right? And, um, and Sister Elizabeth Throckmorton was a real nun whose, paint, whose picture was painted by her family, very wealthy family in the 1700s. And, when they opened up in the back, what happened was it gave her, um, it exposed her 1,200 dead fish and hay, which was the inside of her. And you know, dead, not dead fish, but fish is the symbol of Christ in the Catholic Church. And I did that because when I was raised a very strict Catholic girl, the nuns used to always tell us, you know, if you are ever lucky enough to be with a nun that dies, you will see her heart and soul leave her. And anybody that's in the room with her when she dies, her heart and soul is so pure and so perfect that it literally blinds everybody in the room. And I was like, whoa, that is so beautiful and so intense that I'm gonna to have to become a nun to see that. And I thought that was amazing. But, you know, I have to say that as I, as I began to know the nuns longer and as I got older, I began to wonder, well, maybe not every nun that dies when the soul leaves the, the body. 
Now, since a lot of you are students, I thought I would show you some pictures of when we were building um, the piece, because you never get to see it. You always think these things just appear, right? Well, they don't just appear. You have to really work hard to build these things. And this was uh, myself and my crew down in Houston building them. Um, <laughs> and my friends, no, I'm not going to say, uh, said recently, you're not the one without the shirt on, PETA. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm the, I'm the little head holding on in the back, trying to pick myself up, you know. Um, and this was us also working. And they got me a studio in a PETA factory, P-I-T-A factory down there, which they all thought was so funny. And, um, and this was us building the doors um, with the hay and the dead fish. And the outside was made all by... Um, Rollplex, which is the base of paint um, to uh, secure the the doors, and um, the um, inside between the two, um, the back and the front, was a stairway, and you could literally climb up the stairs and look out her eyes on and and look at the eyes, look out her eyes as the cars come towards you on the highway, which was kind of fun. And But it was built at an angle. So you also picked up all the car fumes, which made you very sick. So I were trying to tell you, don't stand there too long. Because, you know, I absolutely felt sorry for those poor nuns. You know, the nuns take the vow of poverty and chastity and everything else they had no money they they couldn't drink they couldn't do anything fun they had to go in pairs of three never two you know where the priest they had a checking allowance they could drink they could go out by themselves you know they had a they had a good time not the nuns not the nuns i felt so sorry for those nuns now here are the nuns looking at the nuns and the nuns, um, you know, they wrote and asked me, can we have this sculpture when it's, you know, it's a temporary piece. And I was like, so guilty at this point, of course, sister, you can have the nun. Um, you know, it may cost a little bit to move it, but I'll even help you move it if, if you can get the funds. And they were, they really tried to get the funds, but they couldn't get them. They're poor, they have no money. And you see the three nuns, and then that's a novice with the red shoes on and the white top. Um, that's the last time she'll ever wear red shoes. You know, as soon as she becomes a nun, you know, it's onto those black, ugly shoes they had to wear, you know. But this is right before they took the piece down. A friend of mine took this photograph. Now, I just want you to know, they did take a part of this piece. They, showed, they sent me a picture later. They literally took the head of the nun, of Sister Elizabeth Throckmorton, and they got that head by taking a chainsaw and cutting it off. I kid you not. I said to my friend, how could you not have taken a picture of the nuns cutting the nun's head off with a chainsaw? How could you not have done that? That to me, I mean, it's like Saturday Night Live. How could you not have done that? And she said, well, first we were in shock. And she said, then I literally was embarrassed for them that they could not have gotten some gardener to do it for them or someone else. She said, I just stood there and didn't know what to do. And then they put the head on top of their station wagon and off they went to the convo. Now, my father said this would backfire on me. And he's always right. He's a very strict Catholic. And I thought, of course, it would make the cover of art form, you know, every, every sculptor's dream, cover of art form. But no, did it make the cover of art form? No, 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 no. I did make the cover of the Catholic Digest, <laughs> where every artist wants to be, right? Yes, yes, all right, well. Um, back in my studio in New York, I was doing these other pieces, and this is called Head. Um, it's, it's a piece that I was doing. I was working. I live in New York. I've always lived in New York since I did my undergraduate. But I was working in Boston for a group of doctors where I, was, I just became a listener. And I would just listen to people 
who were um, terribly ill. It was a difficult job, um, but one that was incredibly rewarding. Um, I would just listen to them and then I would go out and I would play music and replay in my head what they had told me. And then I would go to my studio and listen to those tapes and make sculptures. And they would often give me things that were of value to them, not of monetary value, just value to them. I would often watch their surgeries. I, I early on photographed surgeries for um, the medical profession. And I was very interested in those kinds of surgeries and sculpture. It seemed to me there was a lot of similarities. So a lot of this work has to do with that. And um, um, so, um, but most people thought I just got this stuff by digging it up out of the ground, which I thought was so interesting because to me, it was so topsy-turvy, you know, this was the tops of trees that I made into the a root looking kind of piece, which was actually the base of it was all blankets from hospitals, uh, beds from terminally ill patients. So it was kind of like all this twist and turns to get to it. And um, one of my first heavy installations was done at the Whitney Museum. Um, and they had done this thing called earth fire wind and all the earth element all the elements and um ann hamilton and i were in it i know you all know ann hamilton um because she lives in columbus ohio and i know she has come here to lecture and um and i, I thought this was kind of interesting i i did this thing i did it in the smallest room that they had and i did these pieces so if you walked by them too quickly, the orchid fiber would kind of fly on you or the Bob wire would kind of nick your clothes. It was kind of a thing like, you know, just slow down, just maybe take a look at things, you know, don't go too fast because New Yorkers do move really quickly. And then um, the last, uh, yeah, the last public piece that I did was this one where I took a tree down South that had uh, what they call burnout, uh, which I think is kind of humorous because a lot of all of us get that, I guess, at some time or other, but New Yorkers, I think, get it uh, a lot. And it was a tree that had been totally burned out and only the skin of it just survived. And I took it and I turned it upside down, which is so my MO, upside down, hanging it you know, always from ceilings, but this one I buried upside down and this is the root system. And I stuffed it with hay. And then I took these hay, I call them hay balls, but they're hay nest for very close to the Australian bird nest. And I um, hung, I made those in New York and shipped them down and hung them from this tree. And some little boys, ooh, they must've been 10 or 12 came by and, and said that they thought they looked like the tree was crying. And I thought that was such a beautiful poetic response. Um, but I have to say the the older generation in um, where this was from uh, North, this was, uh, gosh, I can't remember, somewhere in Florida, um, uh, Palm Beach, uh, really decided they hated the piece. They thought it was terrible, that I was making fun of them that it was a death kind of warrant of some kind. And so um, they took it upon themselves to get little pebbles and throw pebbles at me the whole time I was making this piece, which I just, uh, I tried to go over and speak with them. But um, anyway, it was the last time I did public art. I, I thought, oh, okay, maybe I'm not so good at this. Um, but after that, I took a break and I went to Italy and I just uh, went to a great place um, that we were just talking about earlier, um, a place called Bellagio, where you can just sit and you can talk with mathematicians and scientists and um, all people that are not in your field, uh, writers and everything else. And I kind of got a freshness uh, back in inside me. And so I decided to go to um, all different places in Italy and France and different places in America where they were doing um, all kinds of, um, like I went 
to um, uh, places where they were having um, recycling issues. Uh, like outside um, Venice, they had uh, these places, they, they look like hell, you know, where they were burning things into the air. And this was in the 80s, um, in the mid 80s, where nobody was really interested in this. So, and then I came back and I went to New Jersey where they were, um, where they had um, black sand, which was a byproduct of um, uh, pig iron casting. And, and it was just all over the walls. And so we would scrape it off the walls and I would use that. And now this industry has really moved to uh, India, but the black sand was so black and so beautiful. And, um, and, uh, and now my pieces were not flexible at all. I just built them in my loft uh, on Broom Street. And when I finished, I was like, you know, the person, I, I don't, I just build from my gut. I don't do drawings. I don't make plans. I just build. And then when, of course, when I finished, nothing would fit out my door. Um, and I had a big show to do. So, um, so of course, what do I do? I had to open the windows and five flights of, uh, down, we had to bring the pieces down and, um, they had the cranes come and they lifted them out and it swung way out. And I was standing on the ledge and I saw it coming back to the building and I'd spent so much time. And of course I just stepped off the ledge to stop it from hitting the building. And I didn't realize they had it tethered where they would stop it. And thank God for the other people. This is me right as they grabbed me and I would have just gone down five flights of stairs. All I could see was the sculpture. You know, I wasn't thinking about that at all. Well, they wouldn't let me stand on the ledge any longer, I guess. Um, um, but the, I'll just have to kind of give you quick synopsis of uh, all these pieces. After that, I only used industrial materials and I moved into a bigger studio with bigger doors. And um, we, the materials that I used, I like to mix and match materials. I, I love, love materials. Materials are half of my language. You know, I I see materials, I mess with them, I fight with them. And then we both come to a truce and, um, and, these were, was all horse fence wire, chicken wire, pounding, uh, beating up on each other. And then by the time I was finished with it, I would throw baby powder all over it. And the baby powder was very seductive to the viewers and they couldn't figure out what the smell was. So they would get very close to it and the stuff was ripped to shreds and it, it, totally ripped my hands apart. But when you would get close to it and you would smell it, your breath would throw the baby powder off the piece and around your shoes and you would leave a mark on the floor of the of the silhouette of your shoes. And I love that because there's something very wonderful about this conversation between myself and you, the viewer, that I really love. My pieces are only half made until you look at them and you come in contact with them. And that's why for a long time, I only named them untitled with a number. I now throw a name in, which they always had names, but the, the, you, the viewer looking at them, interacting with them is really what finishes my pieces. Um, this piece, which um, I used to lecture a lot, used to talk a lot and would always be so interested in talking to the artists afterwards. And when I went up to Yale, um, I asked the students, which I often ask many students, like, where are you inspired? What do you look at? Where, where do you go? And the Yale students took me over to this place called Shivoni Alchemy, which was amazing. It was where they took cars and locomotives and they would drop them down three stories. And then they had these things kind of like bread shredders where they shredded up these locomotives and cars. 
and into fine things that look like my hair, you know? And then the, they had pickers, which would pick out all the seats and all the soft stuff. And then they would shred them again until they were just so fine. And then they had this other thing that it was like Mad Max, you know? They sent them into this other building where these massive things where if you were ever caught in it you would die because they would this massive thing that was like a I don't know a, a, I don't I can't even explain it was like this steel thing like a wall of steel that would just come at this all this delicate hair come at it and smash it and another one from this direction and one from that until it became just this little purse and it was so solid and then they would throw it into um a big container that they would send to at that time Japan and they would Jap Japanese would melt it and send it back to Pittsburgh to um it was in bars and then they would liquefy it again and make new cars and all the colors of cars were actually became gold all the blues and pinks and yellows all became gold so i bought some of these purses and before they went to Japan, now that now they send them to China, and I'm sure that's not lasting long. And I would unshred them and drip them off these understructures and then spray them with the black sand that I got from New Jersey. And it was so beautiful. And I bought about three of these purses. Here's a more detailed thing. You can see the the, the beautiful shredded hair. I always called it car hair. And one time when I went there, they had the most gorgeous 1950s Airstream, you know, those Airstream trailers that they use in the 1950s, gorgeous. And I said, what are you doing with that? You're not going to shred it, are you? And he said, oh, yeah, go look at the other side. The other side was totaled. Some truck must have hit it and just totaled it. And I said, oh, how much is that, you know? And he's like, oh, 200, 250,000. I'm like, whoa, are you kidding me? And he's like, yeah, it's all stainless steel, you know? And I'm like, how, how much for like the back bumper to the first tire, you know? And, or even less, you know? And he's like 50,000 for just a little smudging, you know? And I'm like, gosh, I can't afford that. Um, but I went back with a rich friend and I said, how about if we buy this amount? I've gotten these two grants and I can buy this, you buy that. And so he's he sold us like a, a, a like 45,000. She paid for half, I paid for half. And I built this really, this is really big. My head would only come up to the part that's like, from here down, you know, that's a, it's big. And I had this guy that worked for me that looked like a sumo wrestler. He was an ex priest and his boyfriend was an ex minister. The sumo wrestler was big. He must've weighed about 300, 350. And the ex minister was about this big, bright red hair. He's Irish. The two of them were a riot, right? And um, I said to the priest, could you put a Japanese lady on your shoulders? And then she could peek through the hole, you know, because it's about this Japanese tale I want to tell in this performance piece. And he said, well, okay. And so you'd see his huge legs underneath this piece. And then this delicate little Japanese woman's head coming out, you know, of the hole. And I don't know if you've ever read the, um, the, um, oh gosh, the, the uh, seven, oh gosh, what's the name of this? It's a total, if it's not banned now, it will be banned very soon with the way <laughs> things are going right now. Um, it's by Kawabata and it's called House of the Sleeping Beauties. That's what it's called. Have any of you ever read that? You may have to buy it soon or you may have to buy it in South America. Um, uh, but it is 
a great book. No feminist should ever tell you about it. So do not tell anybody I told you about it, but it's a terrific book. Every artist reads it. Um, uh, but it's a great book because of the Kawabata is one of the best Japanese writers. He's got a Nobel Prize. He was the first Japanese writer to ever get a Nobel Prize. He is brilliant. And this book's ideas are so truly strange and interesting. Um, and so this is named after the main character in it, uh, Iguchi. And it's called Iguchi's Ghost and for a very good reason. And you'll know it once you read the book, but don't say I said so. Um, and this is a detail of it. And I put some phosphorus wire in there. And this is one of my favorite pieces. I've kept this piece. And I started to do insta um, performance pieces with Irene Holtman, who is a great, great choreographer, dancer. This is a picture of her. When I first came back from uh, at Lana Pool, I wanted to do something delicate and lacy. And so, and I'd met a, a, an artist there who couldn't get a show for anything. And I told her, oh, you just light candles in Italy and you just pray to the gods and light can put some money in the box and you'll get shows. And she said, I don't believe in that stuff, Peta. I said, I'll do it for you. And so I did a whole bunch for her. And when I got back to the United States, she said, I'm sending you 50 candles blessed by the Pope. Please light them and blow them out. I have more shows than I can handle. I've lost 30 pounds. I do not want any more shows, <laughs> right? So she was going to have a show in New York. So I thought I'd make this hat for her and wear it to the opening, right? And like say, oh, I'm here, you know, ho, ho. And so... I made it, I made it with hot glue, right? And so I said, Irene, will you try this on? And I lit all the candles. Well, not stupid me, hot glue candles, dumb. You know, the whole thing caught on fire, right? And Irene is in it, right? And I'm, and I'm thinking as I'm running for the fire extinguisher, not if Irene's hurt or will she, you know, whatever. I'm thinking, and don't repeat this, um, good God, how many children does she have and will I have to raise them? That, uh, <laughs> terrible. It's honest, but it was a terrible thought. And I've got this, this phone going and I'm coming towards her and she's coming out, right? And she's looking at me like she's gonna kill me and I, rightly so. And she, her eyebrows are on fire. And I'm thinking, oh, God, you know? And I'm swinging this towards her. And she's like going, like, don't you do that. Don't, don't dare hit me with that. And I'm like, really? You don't want me to? And she's like, no. And so I go over her and hit the piece and get the piece all done. And she, and I'm, ready for a scolding like I've never had before. And she just is like, Peta. And I said, oh, I am. And before I can even get out of my mea copa, mea copa, she said, my gosh, how did it look? And I was like, how did it look? And she said, yes, how did it look? And I'm like, well, well, and she said, should we do it again? And I'm like, oh, no. And she said, let's do a big performance. Let's just do a wonderful performance. And I'm like, Irene, and she goes, I mean, I can see it now. And I'm like, and I'm thinking, I cannot, I cannot. And she's like, it'll be wonderful. We'll just do a big performance. And I said, well, not today. Let me do a little more research. And, and I'm just thinking never, never again, you know, because my heart is really in my stomach. I'm just, I'm thinking, you know, lawsuit, tax, you know, I, I just, I saw my whole studio going up in flames, you know, it was just horrible. But anyway, we ended up doing a, um, a big performance at a museum and uh, artist space and, but I will say she was a little abusive with my sculptures after that. She would swing them around and she would hit the walls with them. And she'd say, didn't that look great? And I'd be like, yeah, that looked real great, you know? And, um, but I got her back. 
I would make pieces that were a little too heavy for her. And so she'd be like, yeah, that fit, that's, that's about, I don't think I could hold any more weight, Peta. And I'd like, no, no more weight. And so, <laughs> and this was before Louise Bourgeois did the spider, you know, the, the spider things would kind of bounce. It was really quite a beautiful piece. We would unhook this and you had to count your steps because you couldn't see. And if you bounce too much, the black sand would get into your eyes. I guess I was a little more vindictive than I realized, but um, it was, she is, such a great dancer and then I began to do all the wax big wax shows and um and they were um really wonderful to do and um totally um beautiful in many ways and um the thing that people didn't quite understand were I I would go to Japan I would come back I would be totally motivated totally inspired they didn't quite understand that the white was really inspired by the death. Um, people thought that they were like birthday parties and celebrations instead of really about um, all the sadness that um, that I was feeling. And, um, and I loved when they allowed me to put wax all over the floor because um, I thought that that was something that was really beautiful, but most people did not allow that. Um, the two curators who were unbelievably wonderful were the um, Corcoran Museum and the High Museum. These women were fearless. They were like at the Cor at the Corcoran Museum, not one single crate fit in the building, not one. And yet Terry uh, Sultan was like, fine, no problem. We can just... Um, uh, the circus is in town. We'll get the circus tent and we'll just put that out there and we'll just heat that up and um, we'll just uncrate them outside and be, bring the pieces inside. Not a problem at all. And then when we got down to the High Art Museum, the um, the uh, it was like it was no problem there either. The the um, what do you call that? The the alarm system was in the wall and um, and it was in the way. And she was like, great, just take the wall down, get the alarm system out. We'll bring everything in. We'll build the wall back up, put the alarm system in within one day. And that's what they did. And I was just so thrilled with that. So it was really a, a great thing. So um, I went from that to moving into hair and hair was really, really special. Um, uh, this was right after Tom passed. Tom passed. Um, he um, was doing um, advertising. He'd made, um, oh gosh, I, he made, I don't know, I, like $20 million. And he made enough to save, um, to really start his own big um, uh, company because he really wanted to make his own films without any restrictions. And um, and then he got Hodgkins and died within a year. And so it was really heartbreaking. The only thing that's maybe a blessing is he has two daughters and all the money has been put in escrow for them. And now both of them wanna be filmmakers. So maybe something grand will come from that. Um, uh, but I was um, trying to figure out what made sense. Nothing made sense for me after he died because we had been very close. So I made these maps. I made these maps out of hair. Um, and um, there, were, um, there were five of us. Uh, Tom had a twin and um, he died at birth. And so then two were gone. And so then there were three of us that remained. And so I made these maps and um, the birds were pulling the maps along. And um, as a joke, I made a map so that Tom could find his way to heaven. And um, I made all these twin pieces uh, of us tied together with hair. Um, one was partially gone now, and I was going to then um, have to try to do things to make him proud of me. And, um, the twinning came up a lot. Um, these were actually the two women that started the Whitney. One was the first uh, woman director uh, and only woman director 
at the Whitney and the other was the woman who started the Whitney with her own money, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. And some people thought this was at the Whitney. Uh, some people thought that um, this looked like the two curtains and then the film for women was just beginning to happen. And I love this piece in many ways. I don't plan my pieces, as I said, I just build them. And I step back later and I realize what they are. I don't even often know their names until later. And that's what's so, I, that's what I love so much about my own work for my own self that I, I'm always learning from and I'm always like, oh, that's the name of it. And it drives my assistants nuts. They're like, so what's the name of this? And I'll give them 20 names as I'm building the pieces, you know? But this one, you know, you can see women often help women, you know, her hand is reached out to help. And in the back, it's really a raw piece. And I love that too. Women often leave their work really raw and kind of naked um, in many ways. And, you know, the way they do when they go to the hairdresser, you're always talking and um, leaving things really raw. And women still are just coming through the wall at this point, which is so great in many ways. It gives us a lot of latitude. It gives us a lot of freedom, which is a wonderful way to kind of be. Um, and the dark work that I have, the black work, um, it has a lot of color in it. There's a lot of color buried within it. And a very, very good friend of mine um, was going to Paris. She was going there right after 9-11 and she decided she would just move there to be with her loved one and to marry him. And you know, when you have a friend who's going to marry someone and you just are like, oh, don't do it. <laughs> but you can't say that. All you can say is congratulations. And so I did this sculpture and I told her I was doing a sculpture of her going to Paris. And she often asked me, did you ever finish that piece? And I'm like, no, no, never finished it. And here, when I look at it, all I see is her going across the ocean, you know, just leaving as she trails across the ocean, her, she lost her beauty and her strength and this and that. It's just all the flowers, her everything that was so great about her just fell apart in the ocean. By the time she got to the other side, there was nothing of her left. And of course, that's my interpretation of what happened. The marriage did not last. Okay. I wanted to tell you. Okay, here's another piece um, that was um, uh, that uh, is different from the other pieces that I did. And it's a piece that's at the National Museum. And it's a, a figurative woman, but you have to kind of look to see her figure. And she cries. She cries three times a day. It could be in the night when there's nobody there, but you have to kind of watch. You'll just catch a teardrop falling and it's onto the cement, onto the pavement, and it makes her garden grow. And she has a red hair, red braid, and the braid comes from a man after I lectured, he gave it to me. He ran home, came back, gave me the braid and said, this was my mother's. And he had to have been 80. And he said, um, I was born illegitimate. I came from a very wealthy family in the South. And when my mother found out she was pregnant, she left, she went to Chicago. She was an incredible violinist. She made the first uh, string violinist in Chicago, but we lived such a poor life that my mother died um, very young. And the family came and got me and asked me, what do I want from my mother? And he said, I wanted her hair. And so they gave me her braid and I've kept it all these years and I'm not gonna live much longer. So I felt you would want it and you would do something with it. And I've always felt such a responsibility with that braid. And so it's in this piece and it seems to fit so well in this piece. And in this garden, there's all these birds, love birds, this bird, that bird. But there's also a lot of birds that are fighting. And you have to really look in this piece to see all these things. 
So I'm going to move a little faster now. So um, this was the, the second uh, of the third trees that I built. And this was at um, Mass Mocha. And um, I, this is called Nushu. And it's a, a private language between two women in China. And they're taught this language when their feet are bound. And it's a language they learn and then they can communicate because their lives are very, very sad. At least they they were at that time. And so um, I, um, I built this tree and I put these beautiful peacocks in it. And then I hung from it these, um, these soy birds, these soy pheasants that will only eat soy. And, they're, and they are also so beautiful. And so these, this was my mass mocha show. And um, it's full of birds. And it was a very special, special show. And you could see the birds from different angles. And I really, really love birds. Museums give me all their birds. And I really love taking care of them. They will last forever um, because most of them go back into museums in a different form, which I kind of love in a way. And um, and this, which I think these are all Chinese pheasants and they're so beautiful. Look at the coloring on them. They're really, really special. And, and each piece has all these double and triple meanings. Um, but I leave that to you when you come across them in different museums to explore. This, which was my last show in New York, um, was um, all about, um, really these um, Ariyoshi's books and, um, and finding out the, um, Ariyoshi came to New York when Yoko Ono did and, our, and um, um, all these Japanese young women came to New York in about the 60s and they all came from very wealthy families and they all studied here. And um, I was very curious about their thoughts on things and they found New York um, rather sexist, sexist. And also um, they found that, they, that the Japanese were not as welcome as they thought they would be, as the Japanese had welcomed the Americans. And I think it still had to do a lot with World War II. Um, but I made these pieces um, and each one have different meaning, but this one in particular was about um, her book um, uh, that was entitled, um, I don't know if, you, if you've if you read um, the books um, that Ariyoshi has written, probably not, but um, she's she wrote all these books and she was published in the 50s in Japan, which was unthinkable for a woman to be published in Japan at that time. And she, um, wrote this book all about this young man who uh, invented um, anesthesia. And he was the first one to invent anesthesia. We thought we invented it here, but they actually invented it there before. And it's a true story. And it's based on a mother and a daughter-in-law and they're bickering and wanting the attention of this young doctor. And the young doctor could have cared less about either one of them. And it's the fight, the infighting of these two women. So I made this sculpture about this and, and it has so much, and it was the 1700s. And it seemed to me that women are still having these same difficulties and these same infighting that they had in the 1700s. And this disturbed me a lot when I read this book. And I wondered how we could get over that, how we could come to terms with that, because it's not something we should pass on to the next generation. And I take full responsibility for that in my generation and not passing it on to the next generation. So I've had a tremendous amount of discussions with women my age, trying to figure out like how we can like get over this. And so I made this piece all with velvet, all with flowers, waxed flowers, and this kind of ocean between these two women. And it literally is an ocean. So um, 
that was what this whole show was based on. The last show that I'm going to talk about is the one that I currently have up right now at PAFA. And they asked 20 artists, um, 10 at PAFA and 10 at the African American Museum of Philadelphia, what we thought of um, right now. Of, I'm sorry, my brain, I'm getting brain fog. <laughs> I didn't, I should have had coffee before I did this. Um, what the, what we thought of democracy and did we think democracy was on the rise or did we just think it was failing completely? And so um, I did two floors and um, I like people to come to this, um, to this floor and have their own opinion. I did this floor of my generation and this floor is rather dark. And all the white peacocks, I don't know if you know this, but all white peacock, all peacocks, period, take the souls to heaven. And in Ireland, they allow the peacocks to just roam freely within the cemetery because they know when the when the souls are ready to go to heaven, they take them to heaven. So I filled this tree with white and silver peacocks so they would know when my generation is ready to go. And I thought my generation has done a lot of great things. I can name them all, you know them all, but we've also done a lot of maybe very questionable things. And every generation does that, but there have been a lot of very questionable things. And so this room is very, very dark. It's ready for its send off. And, um, and, and in the back of the room, I have a staircase. It's a three story. This room is 30 feet tall. It's massive, right? And in the back of the room, there's a staircase that goes up and it goes up to a, a part of the museum that's never been seen, not since the civil war anyway. And this building was built. This is the first museum in the United States, by the way, it's a gorgeous museum. And um, when it was first built, people hated it. Now everybody loves it because it's so beautiful. But if you go up this stairway that I built, I cut a hole in the glass ceiling and you can stick your head up this glass ceiling. And when you do, you see all these beautiful wax sculptures that I've made. And, in, and you see the underside of the wax sculptures, which you never see of my wax sculptures. You never see the underside of them. And on the underside is all this beautiful color. And that's to represent really your generation. And you guys have the benefit of, I really have such great hope in you guys of all the things that you will be doing, all the differences you will be making, all the possibilities that you'll be bringing. You know, I'm really so hopeful that you will get over all the racism, the sexism, all the pollution, all the crap that we've dumped on you. I'm so hopeful that you will at least make a fighting chance at it. So that's why all the beautiful colors, all the great things, and you can look down on what my generation has done and, and the generations before. And that's why all the red flowers, all the blood, all the darkness, and you can look down on the top of the tree and you can actually, it was a coincidence, but you can see me discussing with someone your generation sitting on the floor talking. And I think that's a, what a lot of problems get solved, sitting there talking and discussing and making conversation. So that's the end of my talk. And there we go. Thank you. We have a few moments or a few minutes to answer any questions from the audience. Just raise your hand and we'll take the mic to you. We got a question over here. Hi, um, I was just wondering about the smell from the dead fish. And how, what was that like? Like, 
the, the, was it um, strong? The smell wasn't actually too bad because, you know, we coated them. And I did a lot of research up at NYU on like how to preserve them. Otherwise, they never would have lasted five years. And I liked all my neighbors. <laughs> Hi, I'm just interested to hear you talk a little bit about like this relationship between beauty and death. Um, yeah. Between what and death? Beauty and death. Beauty and death. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, well, mm, that's a big one. <laughs> um, there, I, have you ever been with anyone who's died? Yeah. Well, then, you know, I mean, I, I was with, um, I've been with a lot of people who have passed on. And the first one I was with was with my brother, Tom. And, and it's, uh, to me, it's, it's as beautiful as with someone who's been born. And um, if you've never, in America, we've taken that away a lot. And um, it's very, very moving. And, um, and especially if the person's on on that path and they know it's it's going to happen and they're with that path i found it to be very moving and it really changed it changed everything for me that's why after that happened i had to rethink everything in my work i couldn't just keep going on with the same path you have to stop and think gosh what am I doing here? And it's, it's really beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. I feel sad for people that don't have that. And I think that's why also we have um, ceremonies to kind of finalize things, whether they're private or whether they're with groups of people. I think it's a beautiful thing to do that. And I think that's what people talk about when they talk about beauty and death and, um, I think it's um, a very special thing. And when people allow you to be with them when they pass on, it's a very big gift. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you so much for giving this talk. It was so inspiring, incredible to just see all of your amazing work Thank and you. just seeing your like the range of mediums and materials that you work with and also just this huge spectrum of topics that you touch on as well I was just wondering if you ever get like artists block and if you do how you kind of find inspiration or move through that I you know I used to get artist block when I was in college <laughs> but um I don't get it anymore. Um, I suppose, um, I suppose, uh, if anything, I get artist frustration because I have so many ideas and I, I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time. So that's, that's what I feel now. And I felt that since I was about 30. Um, but I remember when I was in college, I would get I would get frozen. And I remember I one semester, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. And I was so frustrated. Um, and I, I remember that so clearly. And, um, and I don't, I, I don't, I don't know what happened. I just don't know. I remember I, I was in a watercolor class and I couldn't do anything I wanted to do. And I tried and I tried and I tried. I wanted to just jump out the, I probably should have just gone away and come back, you know, just gone somewhere for, but I just kept banging my head against the wall and I probably just, just gone, you know, away for a week and then come back refreshed. But I just kept banging my head against the wall. What do you do? Do you have that? Um, I don't know. Not at the moment, thankfully. But I don't know. I think I was just asking for the future. Yeah. I'm sure it'll come up at some point. 
definitely has before. So I I just don't. I don't. I, I guess if I did, I would go to a museum. I'd probably go to the Metropolitan. Yeah. But yeah, the Met is so great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, hello. Um, yeah, thank you for, for doing this. This was very, I mean, it was incredible just to see the pieces that you've made and the work that you've done and just the way that you've kind of moved for those pieces. Um, I did have a, a question about um, perfectionism. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, this, I've been reflecting a lot on the nature of perfectionism and how it can kind of stump artists and it really prevents a lot of growth. And I was just wondering what uh, that may uh, how it may have affected any of your pieces or if you still feel that and um, what advice you would have or what you kind of do to move forward from putting all of your I, I think perfectionism tends to come from a place of putting a lot of your worth into your work um, rather than like who you are and and putting a lot of your joy into it uh, if you kind of get what I'm saying um, so I, yeah I was just wondering what, what your thoughts were on, on that so you mean perfectionism stops you from doing work or yeah yeah often yeah well I, I can't someone told me not to maybe five years ago that um perfectionism is great but the thing that's really great is when you shoot for it and then you make the the downfalls of it are even more lovely. And I thought about that and I thought, yeah, that's really nice. So you shoot for perfectionism and then when you fail, that's what's so beautiful. And I thought, oh, that's really nice. So now I'm always looking for those pits, you know, that are like really, and that's so nice. And because I think there's a lot of artists that are really perfect, you're, you're shooting for that. And if it's too perfect, it's like a snooze bill, right? And then, um, but you don't want it. I think the thing is the craft part. If the crap, either you want it to be crappy craft, and then it's interesting because it's so crappy, right? Or you want it to be perfect craft, so you don't pay attention to the craft, but you're looking at the piece. And, but then you want the perfectionism to kind of slump, but not the craft to slump. So I think those are two different things, you know, the craft and the perfectionism. So, yeah, cause you don't want that to slump. Like you wouldn't want the taxidermy to be poorly done and you to notice that you want, you want the piece to be just perfect but not in a row maybe that's what you maybe that's what it is yeah uh, yeah yeah I think it was very interesting the way that you put it that a lot of the beauty in pieces comes from those the 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 uh missing missing the mark of perfect yeah. um and I I kind of get I kind of think about how like often when I make something and I'm I can see all the flaws in it and the things that I don't like about it often people will look at it and say that that's the part that they love about it oh. um or there's just a lot of um, beauty in it that they noticed that I didn't. Um, and I, so I think it's really, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of uh, important uh, reflection to be done about the nature of us to always want perfect. <laughs> yeah. Just remember that it's always good to listen to other people and hear what they have to say. But in the end, it's your work and only you have to be happy. And that's always a hard thing. It's always hard. Yeah. All right, folks, we have time for one more question. Hey, thank you. Um, I was just wondering the piece that you made, the, the two women with the ocean between them, what happens to a piece like that after the show is over? Well, she's traveling right now and she'll come back and then she's traveling again. Um, uh, she'll eventually, I'm sure, go to a museum. That's probably what her fate is, yeah. Um, and it's at PAFA right now? No, she's um, she's not at PAFA. Oh gosh, where is she? She's not in my studio. Uh, she's going to uh, uh, Chazen um, and 
um, oh gosh, don't ask me these things. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, I always have to get my resume out, but yeah, she's, um, she's, she'll be traveling till 2026. Yeah. Do, do any of your pieces get taken apart and dismantled? Because you said, I think you said you, you got some of your birds from museums. Do you have to, does everything remain after you've made it? Do you take any of them apart and just it, it exists in this room and never again, or? Oh, everything comes apart. You, that tree, that tree, although the museum owns it, that tree, I don't know, that tree must have 22 crates. That tree comes completely apart because we figured we would travel that, but, and it, it is gonna travel, but yes. And that tree was two trees and we made it one tree you know, cause psychologically, I didn't go into all the psychological parts, but yeah, it was, it was two tree cause I wanted it to be very luscious and beautiful, but it's, and, and I wanted it. And when you look at it, I hope you never know that it was two trees. I, I want, I don't want, I don't want you to know that it even can come apart. I want you to think that it can only exist there and that it has to be ripped apart. Yeah. Do you enjoy the process of thinking about how you're going to create it, like take it apart when yes. you're building it? Yes. I love engineering. Totally love engineering. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so very, very much. Bye -bye.